in the summer of 2017, along with a group of students, I stood in a state of shock in front of the gates of the Auschwitz concentration camp memorial. We were trying to make sense out of this aura of gloom and terror that we had just felt inside. You see, Auschwitz was a death camp established by Nazi Germany in occupied Poland during World War II. There they murdered over two million innocent victims, majority of whom were of Jewish descent. Inside the memorial, we saw evidence, stunning evidence of this mass murder, right? Piles of items, personal belongings of the victims of the dead, which were confiscated by the Nazis. Now, you might be wondering what, it, what brought a person of Indian origin to World War II memorial sites in Poland. Well, I may not look very Polish, but my children sort of do because I'm married to a Polish person, and being married into a Polish family definitely kindled my interest in Polish history. Now, World War II caused a lot of death. More than 30 million civilians died, and because of the terrible anti-Semitic policies, over 6 million Jews were killed. And when we typically think of death during war, we think of death caused by weapons, right? Guns and artillery and armies fighting against each other. Now, as a microbiologist, right, I led a study away program to Poland, and we wanted to understand this other invisible enemy, this enemy that propagated, that, that bred rampantly during war, that was disease-causing microorganisms. Right? Specifically, I wanted to study the disease-causing bacterium Rickettsia provazaki. Now, Rickettsia, it colonizes the gut of the human body lice. Here at Furman and everywhere else, we know what our sentiments are towards lice, right? Not only do they colonize the hair, they can colonize all of the human body. That's a terrifying thought. And rickettsia causes a life-threatening disease called typhus fever. And typhus is characterized by high fever, delirium, dementia, depression, and in many cases, death. And the human body lice, it had become a symbol, an omen of death during World War II. But by a bizarre series of events, this foe turned into an ally, and the lice actually ended up saving thousands of lives. And that's the story I want to tell you about. And to tell you the story, I'm going to take you back in time to the summer of 1939 in Poland. As you can see, the weather was fantastic, right? Here is an advertisement urging people to go and uh, go to the Baltic Sea and enjoy the beautiful weather, right? This definitely was the calm before the storm. Little did anybody realize that in a matter of days, their lives were about to dramatically change because on September 1st, 1939, Hitler's Nazi army attacks Poland. You see the Nazi tankers, the Nazi aircraft bombing Poland, and the Nazi soldiers sarcastically holding a Polish flag and breaching into Poland. So the Nazis enter Poland from the West, and just in a matter of a few weeks, the Soviet Union enters Poland from the East. You see, there was this pact between Hitler and Stalin that they each would take different parts of Poland. Only Hitler ignored this pact and later on tried to march further East to take over Soviet-occupied Poland. One such city that is key to my story is Lvov. Okay? Now, Lvov is current, present-day Ukraine, but it used to belong to Poland. And Lvov went through two atrocities. It went through invasions by the Soviet army, followed by invasions by the Nazi army. Prior to World War II, Lvov was a haven for science and research. Two such researchers in Lvov worked very hard to find a cure for the typhus fever. Not only did they try to fight the army during World War II, the invisible army, right? The, the infectious disease-causing organism, they also sabotage the Nazi army as well. And this is their story, too. The first scientist was Rudolf Weigel. Now, prior to World War II, Weigel had successfully developed a cure, a vaccine against the typhus fever. So the Nazis, they aggressively sought after him. They needed him to generate the vaccines for the Nazi army. So they had given him, Weigel, a free hand to run his laboratory as long as he generated vaccines for the Nazis. 
It seemed like Weigel was against an uphill task because, you see, in order to generate the typhus vaccine, he needed to have access to these disease-causing lice in large numbers. There was a glitch. The lice, when infected with the bacterium, they didn't survive for too long. So it seemed impossible that they would collect, they would find enough patients to collect enough lice which, which were infected with the typhus so they could generate a vaccine. So Weigel did something very unorthodox. He said, I'm going to infect the lice myself. So what he did, he lined up hundreds of these lice in a row and he proceeded with their rear ends sticking up and he proceeded to inject each one of them via the rear end individually, right? Now at this point, lice or no lice, I think they, have, they deserve all of our sympathy at the moment. <laughs> but after the lice have been infected, they had to be fed. And here was the second conundrum. These infected lice, which had the bacteria, the bacteria wouldn't propagate when they were fed with blood from rabbits or horses. They needed human blood. So what Weigel did, he recruited volunteers to feed the lice, right? So then what he would do after he infected the lice, he would pack them into little matchbox-shaped cages which had a little mesh on one end. So through the mesh, the lice could bite through the human skin, but they wouldn't land on the human skin, right? Then once the volunteers came in, he would put this contraption, tie it onto the limbs of the volunteers, and after about an hour of feeding, you can see the proof, bite marks, on the legs of the volunteer. And you might be wondering, why on earth would somebody volunteer to be lice food, right? Well, many of these volunteers were Jews, or they were members of the Underground Resistance Army. Because you see, if you were volunteering in Weigel's laboratory, the Nazis did not take you to concentration camps. So they were willing to risk contracting typhus fever rather than being taken to concentration camp. But Weigel had a way by which his volunteers would not contract typhus. The mantra was no scratching. You see, when the lice bit into the humans, they did not inject the bacteria directly into the bloodstream. Rather, during the process of feeding, they defecated. And in the excrement was the bacterium, and when the human started to scratch, they made abrasions on the skin, and that's how the bacteria got into the human system. So simply by scrupulously not scratching, many of the volunteers did not contract typhus fever. And Weigel saved many lives. After the lice, infected lice were fed, then he would dismember them to collect the guts where the bacteria propagated. He would put them in this giant mortar and pestle, and in the presence of chemicals such as phenols, he would extract the vaccines and package them into bottles such as these. Now, to make the vaccines, Weigel needed access to a lot of lice. And so Weigel and his team had easy access to the ghettos where a lot of lice, lice flourished because of the unhygienic conditions there. And in the pretext of collecting lice, on the slide, they would distribute thousands of these vials of vaccines to the inmates of the ghettos, saving their lives. And to meet this demand from the Nazis for the vaccines, sometimes Weigel and his team would dilute the vaccines they were making and supply the Nazis with less, less than effective vaccines. So while seemingly towing the line, Weigel, Weigel fought, fought his own battle right, against the Nazis. The other scientist I want to talk about is Fleck. Now, Fleck and Weigel, they teamed up. They were in the same lab. And Fleck knew Fleck was working on the typhus vaccine as well. Fleck was Jewish, and he was taken first to Auschwitz and later on to another concentration camp called Buchenwald. And at Buchenwald, Fleck was ordered to generate typhus vaccine, and the Nazi officer overseeing Fleck was Ding Schuler. Now, Ding Schuler was a physician himself, and he had committed a lot of atrocities right, using unethical means on prisoners in Buchenwald. He injected them with disease-causing organisms, causing them to, to get typhus fever, cholera, and many other diseases. So he was despicable, but not very brilliant. Fleck called him Dumkoff, or idiot, because Fleck managed to hoodwink Dumkoff into thinking that he was generating typhus vaccines using rabbits and supplying them to Dumkoff, when in reality he was supplying the Nazis with bogus product that wasn't a vaccine at all. But 
he had figured out, Fleck had figured out a way to generate vaccines, small quantities of typhus vaccine, using urine samples from patients who were suffering from typhus fever. And that he's dis distributed amongst the inmates of Buchenwald. You see, at that time, there was hope that the Nazis would lose the war. And if any of them could survive to live, to tell the world about the atrocities that they had suffered in the concentration camps, it would be a shame to die at the hands of typhus. Both Weigel and Fleck were brilliant scientists and they were war heroes. They used the power of their knowledge to save lives. When we were in Auschwitz paying homage to the dead whose ashes have been preserved in Auschwitz, we were surrounded by many other people. The realization struck us that some of the people who were there could be there because of actions of people like Weigel and Fleck. What really resonated with the students during this trip was the fact that they had the courage to do the right thing. And yes, today in hindsight, it's very easy to determine what the right thing was. But imagine in the war times, right? Under times of stress, when you were under the watchful eyes of the Nazis, it probably wasn't that easy. But if you nurture your passion, if you choose your vocation, if you honor your profession, for the right reasons, which is to feed your soul and not your wallet, you would always end up doing the right thing. There would be no duality, because after all, you're answerable to your soul. Right? So let us all agree that we will use our knowledge, our hard work, our passions, our courage towards maintaining a society that is just, that is inclusive, that is integrated, and not a society that, that has bias and walls. Thank you very much.